Wolverhampton Wanderers are more than just a football club. As the premier team in the area, they represent the hopes and aspirations of the entire black country. But back in the 1950s, the old golden black was revered not only in this part of the world, not only in England, but the world over. Well, it was not only a pleasure to have good players, and they were good players, but I think we were very fortunate in having a set of players that were not only skilled, but were very good fellows off the field. They were men of character. They had their own individual flair and character, but they were men of integrity. And I think that part of our success was due to the fact that we had players, self-disciplined, who had their own interest in the game. They had a, a pride in their performance and they had a pride in the club they played for. We won everything, guided by Stan, uh, skippered by Bill. It was a pleasure to play for the Wolves, it was a pleasure to play in those days, it was most enjoyable. Wolves' Billy Wright and Leicester's Norman Plummer hit the Old Midland finalists onto the Wembley. He was obviously rather special on the field, but he was a very good club captain, as distinct from just a, cap uh, a playing captain, and um, did a lot, I think, for the success of the club. The Wolves era of Cullis and Wright set standards for the rest to follow. League champions in 1954, 58 and 59, they also proved that British teams were as good as anything in Europe. Leaving London Airport for Moscow to meet crack Russian teams Spartak and Dynamo, 11 members of the Wolverhampton Wanderers team look fighting fit and ready for anything the Russian footballers have up their sleeves. The skipper Billy Wright leads them. Manager Stan Cullis in the light suit flies with his first contingent of the Wolves team. And there's centre forward Roy Swinburne. Powerful attacking football was the Wolves' trademark, whatever the weather and the FA Cup final of 1960 capped a memorable decade. The irrepressible dealie was the biggest headache that Blackburn goalkeeper Harry Leyland had in this phase of the game. And what a headache. The little winger now got Wolves' third goal. At the final whistle, Dealey deserved his congratulations. Wolves had won 3-0, and Bill Slater led his men, a proud captain indeed, to the Royal Box. From the Duchess of Gloucester, he received the cup. Footballer of the year, Bill Slater, had now achieved a captain's highest ambition. Congratulations to this wonderful club, Wolverhampton Wanderers. The achievements of the 50s soon grew into legend, but they placed a heavy burden of expectation on the next generation of players. When I came here in 1969, Wolves must have been one of the top six clubs in the country. I can always remember when uh, I first came into the club, uh, into the main reception, and the hall was absolutely full, uh, the, like the trophy cabinets and the sort of history, uh, like from early in the uh, early, well, the late 1900s all the way up to 1969. And of course, the main trophies were from the teams of the 50s, and it was fascinating to be to feel that you were a part of that. We were always compared with the team of the 50s, and quite rightly so, because the success that they had then um, is going to be difficult for any team, any Wolves team, uh, to compete with. Um, you know, the, the home bed matches, the Red Star winning the league. So it was difficult, even though I felt that the team in the 70s, especially the early 70s, we had a, quite a lot of success. We got to the UEFA Cup final, uh, we won the League Cup, we were fairly high up in the league, on a couple of occasions and we got to like semi-finals um, which when you look back now you think well you didn't do too badly uh, it was a reasonably successful team but it was still suffering from that comparison um, and I think it's only now um, in the 80s that people look back in the 70s and say yeah it was a good side. Stan Cullis and his team had grown old together and in 1965 Wolves were relegated but a resurgence saw them back in Division One and a return to Europe. This 1972 UEFA Cup quarter-final against Juventus, a timely reminder that Wolves could still perform at the highest level. And there were new heroes to cheer. Richards, Dugan, Mikhailov, Wagstaff and Bailey. Wow. 
Wolves' first goal, a screamer from Frank Munro, he was so far out, he wasn't even in the shot. At the other end, Phil Parks preserved their precious lead. Then to the goal that decided the tie. It was a typical glancing header from the Doug, Wolves winning by the odd goal on aggregate. And although Wolves lost the UEFA Cup final to Spurs, the old Golden Black was once again on the march. Early 70s um, was a lot better than the team in the uh, late 70s when Andy and I paired up. We had, uh, even though Dugan and I were sort of uh, grabbing all the headlines, we had tremendous players round about us like David Wagstaff, Jim McCallio, Kenny Hibbert, Mike Bailey. And so it was an overall team performance. I felt later on, um, when Andy and I paired up, it was a completely different partnership. Um, the style of play was different. We didn't really have, we know, like, without sort of being disrespectful to the players, but I don't think the overall quality of the team was as high as the one in the 70s, early 70s. But Wolves were still able to dish out a hiding to anyone as Derby County discovered at the end of the 1978-79 season. Billy Rafferty was now chipping in with the odd goal, as was a youthful George Berry, sporting that unmistakable Afro hairstyle. And this was Steve Daly's last goal at Molyneux before his £1.5 million transfer to Manchester City. But ever since Mike Bailey's heyday, Wolves had lacked a charismatic team captain, until one day John Barnwell made perhaps his shrewdest signing. Um, well, I was, uh, I was about three or four clubs in at the time, three or four first division clubs, and uh, I came down to Wolves, I spoke with John Barnwell, um, and spoke with Richard Barker, and spoke with the chairman, and was very impressed with all three, then came down and trained a couple of days, was impressed with the setup, the training ground, and uh, the plans they've got for the future, so hopefully I'm going to be part of them. Must be quite a wrench leaving a club like Liverpool. Yeah, well, leaving leaving the greatest club in football is always a wrench, but uh, I can honestly say that I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to playing with Wolves, and I'm looking forward to trying to help Wolves. Obviously, they see your role here as more than just player. Yes, possibly so. Uh, I've spoke with Richie, and uh, Richie says that uh, hopefully some of the enthusiasm that I've got for football uh, could rub off uh, not only on the Wolves players, but also on the, on the Wolves public. And... Uh, if we can start getting some interest back in the town and start getting some uh, following for the club, you can never tell what happens because uh, Liverpool was exactly the same position that uh, in 1962-63 when they were coming out the second division into the first division and uh, their following now is worldwide. I'm sure the cynics uh, are saying you're over the top. I bet you've got something to say to that. Well, I mean, it's, it's entirely their opinion. If they wish to say I'm over the top, then they're leaving somebody else alone. They're selling the papers, so uh, that's what they're paid to do, so let them say it. You still feel you've got some years of First Division football Yes, ahead. very much so, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have come to Wolves or I wouldn't have entertained going to First Division Club if, if I didn't feel I had another couple of years left in me, and, and hopefully more than a couple of years. So uh, I feel I've got it, and good judges in the game think I've still got it, so hopefully we still have. Yeah. Under Emlyn Hughes, Wolves would never be found wanting for effort. In the 1980 League Cup semi-final against Swindon, they displayed all their fighting qualities. 2-1 down from the first leg, two goals from John Richards, now supported by Andy Gray, put Wolves ahead on aggregate. Swindon's equaliser came from the penalty spot, goalkeeper Paul Bradshaw's enthusiasm getting the better of him. But the passage to Wembley was sealed when Gray's shot was blocked and Mel Eve seized on the rebound. Come on, 
Yeah. Emily must have had the wind. It's fabulous, actually. Yeah, it's, uh, I've been so many times. It's, it's untrue, and to go back with a new club in my first year here, it, it's tremendous. I mean, I'm more made up for the lads. You know, the lads that haven't been it, up to Wembley, the likes of Peter Daniel, the likes of George, other players that have battled away for years and years and never had a chance at Wembley. And I've been lucky enough to have been there virtually once every year with Liverpool for the last 13 years. And uh, it's a tremendous feeling to come to a new club and get to Wembley again. Yeah, it's great. I'm disappointed it's not going to be Liverpool, though. Then. I believe so. I believe they've got beaten, yes, haven't they? Yeah. Disappointing for you. I can't, I can't believe it. I thought, I thought they were a million to one on to get through, but. I mean, what can you say about Forest? Third time on a belt to go there. Tremendous record, unbelievable. All, all credit to the players who came back. They showed a lot of character. And uh, I'm delighted for the supporters because we have at last produced something on our own ground which they can shout about. And uh, I said before this week, this is going to be a massive week in the history of Wolverhampton Wanderers Football Club. This is the first step. Now, it might seem a little bit hard. We'll enjoy tonight, but tomorrow we've got to start thinking about Saturday. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and hopefully we'll go on from there. I think playing alongside John Richards was, was great for me. He was a, he's a Wolves legend in his time. There's no doubt about that. I think obviously the best memory I have at Wolves is the, is the League Cup final win and scoring the winning goal against Forest in, in 1980. That was a magnificent day for me. Uh, it was my first goal at Wembley. It was a winning goal and we were the underdogs and we went there and we won and we brought the trophy back to Molyneux. Now Palmer. Palmer with the little touch by Bertels. Doesn't find Robertson. Daniel playing it towards Andy Gray, could be interesting, and this is the goal, Andy Gray has scored it! Needham and Shelton got in a terrible mix, and Andy Gray has the simplest of jobs to put Wolves into the lead. And Emlyn Hughes, a winner so often with Liverpool, now with that beautiful broad smile, is a winner with Wolverhampton. And Wolves are back in business. We didn't get the money, or John Barnwell didn't get the money after that to strengthen his side, and we suffered greatly for it. I think that's why it's important that now when they're on that, they're on a high, they're on the up, that Graham Turner gets some money to spend. Uh, the club was uh, quite successful. Uh, he just got back into the first division, and uh, they'd also just agreed to build the uh, new Molyneux stand, which we can see in the background. I suppose at that stage nobody would quite realise just what would happen to interest rates, which was what hit so many people. That's right. I mean, they uh, built the stand for 2.3 million, uh, borrowed 1.8 million from the bank, and unfortunately no one realised just how interest rates were going to go out the window, and uh, the club was caught, I'm afraid. But on the field, I mean, still very successful? Yes, yes, they were quite successful. Um, they did quite well. Um, and in 1980, of course, got to the uh, League Cup final and finished sixth in the first division. So when were the first signs that maybe all was not quite as, as rosy as we thought? Well, it was just after that, really, start of the uh, 81 season, um, when things started to go wrong. Um, the bank position was continually getting worse. It was a struggle. We were owing money for on transfer deals. and. Uh, Inevitably, in uh, August uh, 82, unfortunately, the club went into uh, receivership. Now, you'd had quite a few years here then. What was the feeling like among people like yourself at that stage? Oh, it was uh, absolutely uh, devastating. You couldn't believe that football clubs, it's unheard of, ever going into receivership. Um, but at the end of the day, um, along came uh, Derek Dugan and his uh, Barty brothers and saved the club at that time and as of after that had 12 months very successful went from the second into the first division it was beautiful yesterday to see uh, especially after being three up and then then Charlton to fight back to make it three each and and the other results to go to go well for us to get promotion yeah 
Super feeling, super feeling coming back on the bus. And uh, you can tell there's a lot of champagne, a lot of uh, booze drank coming back. And it was a very happy coach. I was going to say, you'll be savouring promotion for a few weeks, but ultimately people will ask, is the Wolves team good enough to stay in the first division, survive in the first division? I'll answer your question with a question. That stage. Oh, it was uh, absolutely uh, devastating. You couldn't believe that football clubs, it's unheard of, ever going into receivership. Um, but at the end of the day, um, Along came uh, Derek Dugan and his uh, Barty brothers and saved the club at that time. And as of after that, had 12 months very successful. Went from the second into the first division. Yeah, it was beautiful yesterday to see, uh, especially after being three up and then then Charlton to fight back to make it three each and, and the other results to go to go well for us to get promotion. Yeah, super feeling, super feeling coming back on the bus and. Uh, you know, there's a lot of champagne, a lot of uh, booze drank coming back, and it was a very happy coach. I was going to say, you'll be savouring promotion for a few weeks, but ultimately people will ask, is the Wolves team good enough to stay in the first division, survive in the first division? I'll answer your question with a question. Uh, we're not Forest a few years ago when they scraped it and they went up to win the league. And I think a few people last season were saying it was going to be Luton and not Watford that were going to succeed, and Watford went there and, and obtained the first division by storm. Why not Wolves? They promised so much, I think, and... Um... When they went back into the first division, the first big mistake they made, of course, was they didn't uh, spend any money on strengthening the team. I mean, the Barty brothers and their development company obviously were in it from a development point of view, with the football club as a sort of the central focal point. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't realise they could have spent so much money on the actual football team. This they failed to do, and of course the team just went from bad to worse. And I suppose, as you say, the receiver in once was bad enough. A second time, did you think at that stage maybe that was going to be that? Yes, I must admit, the second time was even worse. I mean, in fact, all the staff were made redundant. Uh, this didn't happen the first time, and it looked hopeless. It looked as though perhaps Wolverhampton Wanderers Football Club were going to go out of existence. But uh, fortunately, in stepped the uh, local authority to take over the ground, and in came the uh, Gallagher's, the building firm from Birmingham, who actually owned the football club. And there was a lot of criticism of the council when they got involved, um, because people were saying, well, you know, it's not a part of a council's function. But they realised the value of having a successful team to the local community. And I think that's proved them right. Um, you know, I think the council bought the ground, including Castlecroft, for 1.1 million. Um, it's likely they will recoup that in the future, without a doubt, um, you know, on the value of the land alone. The Barty brothers, once considered the club's saviours, had become the target of hatred for long-suffering supporters. And for the manager at the time, enough was enough. That this club is in such a state, it's frightening. And I feel that I'm not going to be a party uh, of killing one of the, the finest clubs in the world. Bottom of the third division and nowhere to go but down, these were Wolves' darkest hours. I've had all the lads in and given them a, not a team talk, but a little bit of a pep talk. And uh, I think it's got their minds right on it. It's the easiest time of the season to get them uh, G'd up. But it's certainly got myself going a little bit as well. <laughs> The unthinkable had happened, Wolverhampton Wanderers playing football in the 4th Division. Their opening encounter, an embarrassing home defeat at the hands of Cambridge United. And I don't particularly want to be a manager in the fourth division. I think the first division is the only place to be, despite all the pressures. And I think in Wolves, I've joined a club that's capable of going into the first division. Uh, I think it's tremendous potential, and there's no reason why they shouldn't get uh, back into the first. I think 
with a little bit of luck, it's bottomed out now. You know, we've had anonymous people running the club for, for a long time. There's a little bit of a disaster in, in the way they were going to do the ground. You know, very little atmosphere at, at the moment uh, because of the, of the position of the pitch and two sides of the, of the ground closed off. But despite all those problems, I think it uh, represents a tremendous challenge. The extent of that challenge was brought home to new manager Graham Turner in Wolves' exit from the FA Cup. An astonishing 3-0 defeat by non-league Chorley Town. It were good times in one respect because you know all the lads did stick together. The club was really on a down, you know. They were uh, they they weren't too well run at the time, you know, and things weren't going too well. When I signed, they were bottom of the league and 15 games left, you know, and it was all set for us to go into the fourth division, and which did happen, which was a bit of a disappointment. But um, obviously, then um, we had the Chorley thing. So what that was that night like when you lost to Chorley. Oh, it was terrible. It was a bit embarrassing for myself really because. At the time when we played Chorley, I used to play in that, that league for Southport in non-league and I knew quite a lot of the players who were played against and they thought I was stepping up into the football league and they seemed to be a better side than us that night and it was a little bit embarrassing, you know, and it was the worst I've ever felt in my life as far as a football match is concerned, especially with the, um, the name Wolverhampton, Wolverhampton and Wanderers has had over the years, so it was a big disappointment. It seems a long time ago now, um, all the problems that I inherited, uh, the most or worse being the attitude in the dressing room, which was one of acceptance of defeat. There was uh, the whole place uh, smelt of defeat and the problems that had gone on in the previous four or five seasons. And my reception at the club was not too uh, happy to say the least. The crowd uh, didn't particularly want me at the club. I got the sense, uh, the feeling in the dressing room that uh, uh, certain sections of the players weren't too happy that I was coming in. Uh, but nonetheless, despite the fact that in the early part results went very badly, including the FA Cup defeat by Chorley, that's been well chronicled, but nonetheless it was probably the lowest point in the, uh, in the club's history. Uh, but having said that, it was also, I think, the turning point. I think it brought home to everybody just how low the club had, had fallen. And from that point onwards, uh, players came into the club, we gradually improved the attitude and we started to win games. And after a good run finishing off that season making the playoffs we were all disappointed not to, to get promotion in the playoffs but even that with hindsight was, was probably a blessing how much as well was it a problem that this club had got such a history uh, I think people at that time tended to talk about uh, what had gone on in the 50s and all the great players that had been here and the great managers but once the resurgence started once the revival started I think the 50s were almost forgotten I think everybody now is highly delighted to have fresh heroes, fresh people that they can stand on the terraces and sit in the stand and relate to. And obviously that comes in, uh, uh, brings in Steve Bull. Bull. I said very early on that he'd got all the natural qualities of a goal scorer. He was brave, he was strong, and he wasn't afraid to have a, have a shot at goal. I said also that he, he was possibly lacking in one or two areas from a skill point of view, and I think everybody would, would agree that. But I, I did also say he's only young, uh, he's got a lot of time to learn, and the way he's developed, I think he's, he's, he's beyond anybody's dreams. I'm envious of the lad. 50 goals last season, 50 goals this season. It's a magnificent achievement. No matter what anyone says about it's only the fourth division, it's only the third division. Chances come along and you have to stick them away. 
he'll get the same chances, maybe not as many, but he'll get the same chances, the same type of chances in the second and first divisions. And if he's good enough to stick my way now, I think he's good enough to stick my way at a higher level. I've actually played against Stevie a couple of times, and he is a handful, a complete and utter handful. He's single-minded in that he wants to score goals. I love his attitude. Um, he's got rough edges, but I like rough edges. I mean, I've played 15 years with rough edges and it didn't do me any harm. The minute he came to the club, we played up front together straight away. Obviously, I think we just work hard for each other, you know, and, you know, put every effort in to help each other, try and talk to each other on the pitch, you know, and things just seem to spin off from there, you know. Before we know it, I started laying goals on for Steve and he was banging them in the back of the net, you know, and obviously things have just worked out from there. I think he's maintained that sort of uh, rapport with the supporters and that sort of image. Uh, it comes across as a lad that enjoys his football and enjoys being part of the Molyneux setup. Graham Turner has overcome many obstacles in his reign as manager. But his greatest contribution to the Molyneux story has been his ability to assess and select the right players for the club. I think the, uh, there's been a number of combinations that have come through in the side. It emerged at the back with two players that were already in the club, uh, Floyd Street and Ali Robertson, um, began to get a good understanding and emerged as, as two very good central defenders in the, in the lower leagues. And then towards the end, Mick Gooding and Nigel Vaughan in midfield started to, to combine well. So I think that it's rather than looking at individuals, I think it's been combinations through the sides that, uh, through the side that has done well. Uh, Mark Kendall has played a big part in the, in the team in goal with all his experience and, and his know-how. found a right depression about the place and now I think suddenly the sun's shining on Molyneux again. You know, it's, it's a great place to be at at the moment.
We'd come through the fourth, not really added a player to the to the squad, uh, and yet we were made favourites to win the third. And when we started the season off, I'd, I'd got grave doubts that we were good enough to do it. But with hindsight, I probably underestimated the strength of our squad and overestimated the strength of, of the third division. And we took, uh, went to the top of the table, I think, sometime in October and stayed there until the end of the season. Uh, that in itself is a great achievement. I think being top of, of the table adds a lot of pressure to, to the players and to the team. And uh, I think the players have, have handled it very well. They deserve to go up as well. Good, good. Strong hard side, but it was a tough game, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was. It was a tough game, but we did enough. We did enough. Enjoy it. Yeah, cheers.
Yes, it's been two and a half years and he can't expect any more that's happened and hopefully next year he'll carry on the same tradition. It's a big club and hopefully now he can stay for another year and, uh, and I'm sure he'll do well in the second division. Is your highlight of, the, of your career, do you think? Yes, it's been, been fantastic today. I must thank, I've kissed Robbie Dennison 300 times for taking me out of the uh, mire tonight. And after the second goal went in, oh, I wish the ground uh, opened up and uh, swallowed me. They gave you a good run uh, for your money tonight. Since uh, Robbie scored the second goal, I think it was, it was an even match. And uh, the draw both of us up to the uh, second division, so hopefully both can do well next year. But you know all about the second division, you're looking forward to that? Yes, if I can get a contact, I'd love, I'd love to uh, see it next year. Because there'll be a few local derbies, we've got uh, back to West Brom hopefully. And yeah, that'll do well.